All right, hello everybody. I'm coming to you from the minivan today. Apologize, apologies for any inconvenience, although I don't think it should make much of a difference from your end, but probably is less aesthetically appealing in the finished product. But either way, what we are gonna talk about today, or at least start talking about, is statistical power and how to figure out how much power you have in your experiment. Um, and uh, I think I'll just preface this by saying I'm gonna split this video up, the previous video on t-testing was over an hour long uh, which is a lot to talk um, a long time to talk uh, especially when you're in a minivan uh, and it's probably a long time to watch as well so uh, I'm gonna split this one up uh, we're gonna do the first part is gonna be just like the concept of how you calculate statistical power uh, and then I'm going to talk about how to actually do it in a subsequent video as well as talking a little bit about uh, what is called effect size um, in statistical analysis uh, but we'll save that for next time hopefully I'll make those by tomorrow because I'm running out of sunlight here uh, in the uh, on the little parking spot in front of my house. Uh, all right, so let's get to it before it gets dark. Um, this is new stuff. We're talking about statistical power. I've got a little note here, <coughs> which I actually wrote to myself a long time ago, which is that I fi find the analysis of statistical power a bit weird, and it's a little bit hard to wrap or at least at the time it was hard to wrap my head around. It may be so for you the first time we talk about it, but thankfully I'm recording this video so you can watch it more than once if you want to. Uh, and this was the case when I first started talking about this a few years ago. Uh, it makes a little more sense to me now, but like I said, it might take more than one repetition before it kind of gets through um, the preconception, uh, the mess of preconceptions inside your noggin. All right, so to help us think about this new way of looking at the, the statistical world, let's first go back to the old, and I apologize for this a bit, but um, this might wind up being boring, this first part of this lecture, because it's going to be stuff that we've talked about before in detail. Uh, but since it's complicated in its own right, it might be helpful to review it all anyways. So here we go. Um, this is just a review of hypothesis testing, how this works. Um, and I want to start by reminding you of the sort of breakdown we have for different um, results for a hypothesis test. Uh, and we have to break it down in terms of, number one, what decision we make uh, based on the results of our test, and then also what the reality is sort of hiding behind uh, the results of our hypothesis test, because we can't get at the reality directly, or at least not using any of the methods we're going to study in this class. Um, that's out there. We know it's out there. We just can't see it. Uh, and we make decisions about what we think is going on in reality, um, kind of in spite of that um, partial ignorance, I guess you could say. So remember, we have this thing which we're representing as H sub zero. It's called our null hypothesis. That could be either true or false. And then we either accept that null hypothesis or reject it. When we accept it, when it's true, it's called a hit. When we reject it, when it's false, we get a correct rejection. The hits and the correct rejections are sort of the correct inferences to make in this paradigm. But as we know, we can make mistakes, right? So there's two types of mistakes. Uh, one's called type one and the other is called type two. The type one error is known as a false alarm. That's when our null hypothesis is true and we reject it anyways. So this means that uh, nothing, if it, the null hypothesis is true, that means that reality is boring, nothing special is going on aside from what we hypothesized about it. And we reject it anyways. We think that something special is going on. That's called a false alarm. Turns out there's not a fire. We didn't need to worry about it, but we didn't know that at the time we rejected the null hypothesis. The opposite case there is where the null hypothesis is false. Yes, there is a fire in your bedroom, but you just accepted the fact or pretended that there wasn't anything going on, so you miss it. Um, and that's a different problem in its own right. But this is called a type 2 error when you miss it, uh, when actually the null hypothesis is false. Okay, so like I said, brief review, uh, and I also wanted to remind you of sort of the um, notation we use to talk about the proportions involved in terms of the different hypothesis testing results. We can get out of this sort of two by two um, framework for the paradigm. So uh, the correct responses or the numbers of correct responses are kind of defined uh, in a derivative or a negative manner because what we're focused on is uh, how many mistakes we're going to make that are type 1 errors, which we call alpha, uh, the percentage of 
false alarms we make in this paradigm is known as alpha or it's transcribed as alpha. The percentage of type two errors we make is called beta. That's the number of misses we make. And then our uh, correct hits are is that's one minus alpha. So alpha and one minus alpha will add up to 100%. And then the number of or percentage of correct rejections we make is one minus beta. Uh, so beta and one minus beta will also add up to 100% because we can't control what the reality is. It's either true or false. We just make one of two different decisions. We either accept or reject. So uh, looking down the columns, these are going to be 100% every time. And that just depends on what the world out there is doing uh, outside of us. Um, but Aside from that, we can accept or reject uh, as the the proportion of times we accept or reject is, is kind of dependent on what we want to do. Um, and we can control that to some extent. Although, of course, uh, for other people to actually pay attention to what we're going to do, uh, we have to be reasonable to some extent. And I guess with the caveat with that uh, is I'm talking about the scientific world where people are at least ideally trying to be reasonable about this. We know that in like say internet land or the modern world we live in, people can say all sorts of things and other people will take them seriously. Um, but ideally we're trying to figure out what's going on in reality. Uh, and we're trying to do that by sort of accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis at an appropriate or most reasonable proportion. Um, okay, so talked about this before, we can set our criterion alpha Kind of to kind of determine how often we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis. And by convention, I guess if you're doing things by convention, it's not necessarily according to reason, but it's a pretty reasonable criterion we have, which is to set alpha to be 0.05, which means that 5% of the time that the null hypothesis is true, we're going to reject it anyways. So we're going to make a mistake one out of 20 times where the null hypothesis is true, we're going to think that it's not true. Um, at least this is what we normally do in social social, uh, social sciences statistics. <laughs> yeah, and like I've said before, uh, in other fields, that proportion may differ. I'll talk about that again later in the uh, second and third parts of this lecture. Um, yeah, but the main moral of this story is you can tweak this parameter if you want to. You could set alpha to be less than 0.05, or you could raise it to be higher than 0.05, depending on the goals of your analysis, basically. So you can control this dimension, your decision dimension, but you cannot control reality. Um, yeah, so that's beyond us, and that's what we're trying to find out because it's more interesting to know what's out there that we can't control. Um, okay, so as I said before, if alpha is 0.05, we only get false alarms 5% of the time, which is not that many, that high of a percentage of mistakes, at least not for us. I think I might have mentioned this before, but there's an old saying that nobody dies if a linguist is wrong. Uh, so if you want to be wrong 5% of the time, nobody's going to die, probably. Uh, anyways, this will also mean that we're going to be correct 95% of the time. Um, hopefully we all live a little better if a linguist is right, because uh, again, that's our goal. And 95% of the time is a pretty good batting average to borrow a baseball metaphor. But I think if you got a grade of 95% in some class at university, you'd be pretty happy about that anyways, too. Um, but what we're missing out of this uh, calculation is how often we're making mistakes and accepting false null hypotheses. So this alpha breakdown, which we're setting, that's our criterion, which again, we have control over, um, kind of determines the split between these two rows and this column, but it's not telling us exactly what's going on with beta. Um, and part of that uh, is because we can't control reality. We can't control whether the null hypothesis is true or false, but there is actually a connection between alpha and beta whereby when we tweak alpha, we're going to change beta a little bit too. And that's the main goal of what we're trying to understand here um, in this lecture and in this endeavor of in analyzing statistical power. Um, the two levels of mistake making, type one errors and type two errors, are related to one another. And so what I want to present to you today is, to, you know, an explanation of why that um, is the case. So to do that, Let's revisit exactly what we're doing when we draw inferences from a sample of data for the sake of hypothesis testing. And as I do this, I'm going to turn on the engine of the car because my thermometer here says it's three degrees Celsius. Otherwise, I wouldn't be out here if that was Fahrenheit. Um, okay, so how does um, hypothesis testing work? Number one, let's think about this. Uh, one of the things we have to kind of conceptualize to make sense of the hypothesis testing paradigm that we've been playing around with is a sampling distribution. And this is a weird thing. 
I had you guys do a homework where you were explicitly creating sampling distributions and most of you got it, but not everybody did uh, because it's just kind of a funny thing to think about. But what you do when you create a sampling distribution is that you take multiple samples from some population uh, and rather than looking at all the individual values of items in your sample, you just take the mean of the individual samples and then you take all of those means and plot them in a distribution and patterns start to emerge. So what patterns we see there um, thankfully have been worked out by brilliant mathematicians of the past. Um, and we see that they relate to the original population distribution in a specific way, uh, which is dictated by the tenets of, or the, um, I guess, properties of the central limit theorem. Okay, so what the central limit theorem says, it describes this relationship between the population distribution and the sampling distribution. The sampling distribution, again, just being a set of means of samples taken from the population. So what the central limit theorem says is that N or the number of items in your sample increases, then number one, the sampling distribution will become more normal, even if the population distribution is not. Number two, the mean of the sampling distribution will approximate the population mean. And this is useful if we wanna to try to figure out what the population mean is. Uh, we can start to get a sense of it from looking at multiple samples of the population. Thirdly, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution will approximate the standard deviation of the population distribution, which we call sigma, divided by the square root of n, which is the number of items in the sample. Um, and I'm gonna add a note here in the notes <laughs> um, and say that n is the number of items in the sample. And I've got it notated here as a lowercase n. Uh, you will often see this as an uppercase N in st the, the statistical literature. Uh, and maybe that's officially the way it ought to be. I'm, if so, I'm gonna just concede that and say, I'm sorry to the real statisticians out there. I'm gonna put it in these notes as a regular lowercase N, uh, just to be kind of consistent throughout the whole thing. But if you just see an N by itself, that's what it means, including in this equation down here, where I have it in the bottom half of this, um, property of uh, this equation describing the property of how the standard deviation in the population relates to the standard deviation in the sampling distribution. <clears throat> Apologies for any confusion about the notation. The other thing I should mention, which I mentioned multiple times before, but um, this I did not make up and this I think is confusing for many reasons, but the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is commonly known as the standard error. Uh, and again, the reason it's thought of as an error is because you're trying, it's with the presumption in the background that you're trying to estimate what the mean of the population is. And by creating these sampling distributions, we're trying to figure out what the mean of the population is. And in so doing, we're gonna make a certain amount of error, which is simply based on the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Um, but this again is a standard error. Standard error equals standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Okay, this again is all review. Sorry if it's boring, uh, but a lot of things in life that are important are boring and the best way to learn them is through repetition. Uh, question number three, what are we doing when we run a one sample t-test? Uh, and so again, we're not gonna do this one sample t-testing a lot in linguistics. Um, I'm just gonna use it here in this uh, lecture primarily because it's simpler to understand than the two sample t-test approach um, in terms of thinking about the relationship between sort of our hypothesized or our hypothesized mean and our population mean, which will be crucial in sort of the analysis of power as we go through this. Um, okay, so we're just doing a one sample t-test and this is just to remind ourselves of what we're doing here technically as the foundation of this, even though we're probably not gonna do it very much in the rest of the semester. Okay, so when we do run a one sample t-test, number one, we grab a sample from a population and calculate its mean, which we note as X bar, and then standard deviation, which is the regular S rather than the Greek letter sigma. Secondly, we wanna know the likelihood that that mean, this X bar, came from a sampling distribution with the same mean as the hypothesized population mean, which we call mu. Uh, 
Um, because populations live in the world of Greek letters. Okay, so to tr try to figure out what this likelihood is that the mean of the sampling distribution, or that the mean came from a sampling distribution with the same mean as the hypothesized population mean. A lot of words. What we do is, number one, just assert that the population mean or the sampling distribution mean is at a particular value. So this C sub one here is our hypothesis. We're just saying the population has this mean value. And then if the central limit theorem holds and we take lots of samples from that population, the sampling distribution mean will be the same value. Um, so whatever individual sample mean we got, this X bar has to have some sort of relationship to where that population mean is according to the central limit theorem. Uh, to figure out what exactly that relationship is, though, we need to know how far away those two values are, the population mean or the hypothesized mean and the sample mean. To get a sense of how that works, we have to estimate the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which we estimate using this equation, sigma, or S, sorry, divided by the square root of N, number of items in the sample. And then because we've done that, we can basically run a z-test um, more Technically, we'd probably run a t-test for reasons I've talked about before. But you basically calculate how many standard deviations the sample mean is from the hypothesized mean. So uh, this looks like a z-score, but it's called a t-score. So it's the sample mean minus the hypothesized population mean. Divide that by the standard error or the estimate for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. That's s divided by square root of m. This gives us a t-score. With that t-score, we can determine the probability of getting that t-score for a sample that comes from a population distribution with this hypothesized mean and the degrees of freedom of n minus 1. Okay, this is all review, and I apologize if that totally bored you again. Uh, and hopefully you understand it by now because we're going to build on this to try to figure out how many times we get type 2 errors in this sort of analysis. Okay, so the last step of this is we've gotten P out of step number four from our T-score. And what we need to do is figure out on the basis of that P value, whether we're going to accept or reject the null hypothesis. And I mentioned this already in this lecture, so I'm not going to dwell on it some more, but normally alpha is set to 0.05. So if that value of P is less than 0.05, then we're going to reject that null hypothesis. And I've got a graphical example here to kind of help you try to understand this. Uh, and in this graphical example, I'm going to keep it very simple and say we're going to use a standard normal distribution as our sampling distribution. So let's say we've got this really boring, simple world out there where there's some, you know, uh, variable of interest that has a mean of value zero. And its standard deviation, um, at least in terms of its sampling distribution, is 1. Uh, so it's going to look like this. Uh, and basically, I'm going to collect samples from some population, and the mean of that sample will fall on this distribution somewhere. If it happens to fall way out here in the tail, like say I get a sample mean of 2, how dramatic is that, then it's beyond this red line, which is my alpha criterion, it's over here in the right-hand side of this distribution where I have, say, 5% of the whole distribution. Uh, and then I'm saying, well, I'm that far away from my hypothesized mean. For that reason, I'm going to reject my hypothesis and say, oh, maybe the actual mean is somewhere else, probably somewhere closer to 2. Um, that's what I'm doing here in figuring out how do I interpret the p-value that I get out of the um, mathematical process that I walked you through on the previous set of slides. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything further about this per se. Um, this is just the setup, but we will look at this sort of graphical depiction of this process uh, by thinking in terms of these sampling distributions. Um, as I do so, I want to remind you, um, number one, I'm doing this online for the first time. Normally, I do this in class and draw a lot of stuff on the board as I do so. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things I draw on the board is a combination of the population distribution and the sampling distribution um, for whatever populations we're looking at in this paradigm. Uh, it's that doing that 
with these slides turned out to be more complicated than I want it to be. So I'm just skipping the population distribution here. I'm skipping that part of it. But uh, underlying the sampling distribution is a population that has a mean of zero, but that it also has a standard deviation, which is basically wider or bigger than the sampling distribution standard deviation. Because um, if you remember, go back to the central limit theorem, uh, if I can, this one right there, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is going to be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. So it's always going to be smaller than the population standard deviation. That curve that we get here for the sampling distribution is always going to be narrower than what we see for the population distribution, which will be the you know same shape, but just kind of fatter overall. But remember, there's a relationship between the two of them. <clears throat> and I kind of apologize for not drawing both, but I think it'll clean up our analysis a little bit and hopefully make this a little bit understandable. As I said before, what we've got here um, is this hypothesized mean for the population, but because of the central limit theorem, our sampling distribution mean should wind up being the exact same thing. The standard deviations are going to differ. The shape of the distributions, well, those may differ as well, but what we wind up getting out of the sampling process is a sampling distribution, which is always going to be normal, uh, as long as n is big enough. We've got this alpha criterion here, and then in this right-hand tail, we've got just 5% of the sampling distribution. So we draw up this criterion here, this red line, so that it kind of uh, cordons off just 5% of the distribution over here on the right. And then if we get a mean value like way over here, like this one's maybe three or so, so far away from this hypothesis that we say, oh, let's reject that null hypothesis. I don't think the mean of this distribution is actually zero. I think it's gotta be something different. I don't know what, but at least it's not zero. On the other hand, let's say we have a mean which is much closer to zero. I don't know where this one is exactly. Maybe it's negative one or so. That's close enough to this that our p-value is gonna be bigger than 0.05, more than, this is the 95% uh, of the other part of the distribution. We'll just accept the null hypothesis in this case uh, and just move on with the rest of our lives, assuming that what we have assumed, what we hypothesized is actually true. Um, but remember, this is how we're splitting up the world, right? I told you um, before, like we can't control what the reality is of the situation, but we're controlling like what decisions we make based on our uh, what data we collect from that reality, right? So we've got alpha over here on the right-hand side of this graph, and then we've got one minus alpha over here on the left-hand side of this graph. And we're just dividing it up into two, and the whole thing is gonna add up to 100%, um, but basically we're making a decision one way or the other based on this single data point that we get, uh, which we assume is on this sampling distribution centered around a mean of zero. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Because like I said, we're going to add to it. And it's getting dark. It's starting to become kind of Halloween-y out here. But we'll survive, hopefully. Did I ever tell you about the rabid coyote that was in my neighborhood? Well, if I didn't, ask me about it some other time. All right, so anyways, um, there's an important distinction at play here. And I mentioned this before, right? So number one, uh, we have what we observe, which is our sample the data we collect from reality. And then we also have uh, what we hypothesize about that underlying reality. So we start off with basically a picture of how we think things are gonna go. And then we collect data, um, which you know may go the way we expected the, the data to go based on our hypothesis, or it might not. But basically these two things are not the same. That's the main thing to keep in mind. And our p-value basically tells you how good our data fit the hypothesis that we started out with. That's what the p-value represents rather than representing something about the reality of the situation per se. It's more about this relationship between our expectations and our observations. Um, so with that in mind, our hypothesized population distribution may not be at all like the actual population distribution. Number two may not be the same as number one. And in fact, pretty much always, there's gonna be some difference between the two. It's just a question of whether that difference is dramatic enough for us to reject this hypothesis, hypothesis that we're starting out the experiment with.
Um, okay, so this is important. And what's important about it, in addition to what I've said here, is that there may be a totally different underlying reality, right? We're trying to get observations to tell us if there's a different underlying reality from our hypothesis, but in most cases there probably is. So I'm gonna redraw our gr graph with two different population distributions. Um, actually, yeah, so we're redrawing our graph with two population distributions. One um, is the hypothesized mean. Um, one has the hypothesized mean, which will stay the same. We'll still call it zero. And then there's gonna be another with the actual population mean, which is different from the hypothesized mean. And I'm kind of confusing myself a little bit here because I think I'm gonna wind up drawing two sampling distributions, not two different population distributions. So I'm gonna to try to keep it consistent there. Uh, and I apologize for that. Um, so, and then note that both of these populations would generate different, actually, I'm, yeah, I'm screwing myself up. Both of these populations are going to just, generate distinct sampling distributions with different means. So I'll leave it there uh, and just say we have a guess about reality on the one hand, and then we have actual reality. And again, we're not going to see what actual reality is. We just know it's out there, right? That's kind of the problem with reality. Uh, and that's why we have a job is to try to figure out what it is, even though we can't see it directly. All right. So alpha is going to be the proportion of the sampling distribution for the hypothesized mean that falls to the right of the criterion line. And you'll see what I mean here in a second. And then we have beta, which is our type 2 error proportion. And that's going to be the proportion of the sampling distribution for the actual mean that falls to the left of the criterion line. <clears throat> so before we just had one sampling distribution, we didn't have that much to worry about because we're just splitting the world into two. But now we wind up with two different distributions in a world where things could go four different ways. So